What was the basis for – what was the basis upon which the safety officers present had decided – why did they think Mr. Zak was a potential suicide? What was the basis for that? Well, the initial call that was received via the 911 system was the report of someone attempting suicide. So the way the call came in, the way it went out, and the way it was dispatched was an attempted suicide in progress. And what was the basis then, if that was what they thought, what was – what's the basis for surmising, because most of the testimony here tonight is that he wasn't a violent person, what's the basis for surmising he might have been violent? Again, my report never says that he was violent. It says there was a potential for violence. And that, not necessarily specific to this individual, but any individual attempting suicide has the potential for violence. And that comes with the training associated with negotiations and dealing with people in that situation. So in other words, it doesn't necessarily reflect the judgment about this individual. It's the custom and practice that someone who's already – whether or not you got it right, that you think someone is suicidal, that since they're already in this kind of extremist mindset, that they could do things that are erratic and would harm somebody. Correct. Okay. What does that mean, though, from the point of view of trying to get close enough to speak to him? Because a lot of people talked about that. Well, I mean, that was the thing that needed to be done in terms of the ideal response was to initiate – again, I reflected this was a suicide-type call as opposed to a water rescue call. And early on, the earlier on that they could make contact with him, someone in a position of authority offering to help, offering him a rescue buoy or something to hold on to, would have been the ideal methodology for dealing with this case as opposed to someone just marching in and trying to drag him out of the water. The appropriate thing to do was to initiate that offer to help, initiate that communication. And as you initiate that communication, you can then assess, get a little better assessment of the person's mental condition. Are they resistant to you? Do they appear to be resistive? Are they showing any physical signs of the conditions out there? Are their lips turning blue because the water is cold? Are they having difficulty breathing? So you make an assessment, and once you have that initial contact, that offer to help and that assessment, then you make your next logical steps. I'm going to change subjects real quickly. I'm just going through the list. I'm not going to ask you whether or not you wrote this report. I think that was largely a rhetorical set of questions since the questioner at the same time asked you to answer those questions. But just for the record, would you please state whether anyone else wrote this report with you? I wrote the report. And is there anybody else who's a member of FireChiefs.com? No. Okay. So this is your report and your work. Yes, I'm the principal of FireChiefs.com. And it is based upon your experience? It's based on a combination of interviews that I did as well as consultation with other professionals in the field from other departments and water rescue programs and my own experience in hostage negotiations and water rescue. How do you – so let me go to something else that that speaker addressed. How do you explain the differential between the 54-degree water temperature that you cited and the readings that the buoys cited? I got my information from a website also called windsurf.com, in which has a sensor mounted in the water along – next to the USS Hornet, which, you know, you can go to the website and gather historical information about date and time based on what that sensor collected. So let's say that the buoy information that was placed into the record by the questioner was actually more correct. Wouldn't that have indicated a longer time period for the survivability window than yours? It would be a longer survivability. And, again, the assumption that the fire department and police department were operating on that they had, again, they were operating under a misbelief, but nonetheless it was their belief that they had a proper type boat with people trained and equipped to deal with the situation on the way. So if the water had been warmer, you would have expected him to survive longer. Correct. Even at 54 degrees, as I mentioned before, the table that I refer to that's published by the United States Life Saving Association that's in my report, it's reflective of someone who is in deeper water, who's actually treading water, swimming in colder water, not just standing in it. So even based on that chart, 
the expected survivability would be longer. Now, to be honest, I have no information that, they, that the department had that information to them at the time. The information at the time was based on a judgment made by a member of the department based on their experience. And then last but not least, um, the question that uh, came up with uh, one of the final um, presenters. So why do you think, I mean, I know that there aren't documents here for it. Why do you think the program was discontinued, the water rescue program? There had been budget reductions in both the police and fire department in the two previous years. Uh, that included across the board reductions, 5% and then additional 4%, I believe. And that also impacts all aspects of the budget uh, over time as well. When, when the uh, then fire chief sent a memo to the then city manager that he intended to, he, he had assessed his overtime budget, and based on the assessment at the time that he wrote the memo, he believed that there was $10,000 available within his overtime budget to move forward with the training. And that's what he told the city manager. The city manager responded to that email by saying, yeah, you know, she approved as long as he did not go over his budget. Okay, and is there anything in, in your review, because we opened up all the records to you, is there any writing after that between the uh, former fire chief and the former city manager addressing this and sort of closing this loop? No, there was a subsequent memorandum after that that came from his deputy chief to the department indicating that they were ceasing the water rescue program until people could be trained and specifying dates uh, in the future, 40 to 45 days or 30 to 45 days in the future, in which they intended to conduct that training. Okay, that so was the last <coughs> documentation I could find related to um, the, the water rescue training. It did not happen. So, so just to be clear for those who don't have the documents in front of them, there was a memo on March the 9th that went back from the city manager to the fire chief saying, quote, as long as there is dollars in this year's budget to pay for it without, all caps, going over, then I don't have a problem with it. And then a week later, the deputy chief says, um, I'm currently scheduling time to complete instructor training and land-based rescue training. When this training is complete, the rescue swimmers will be recertified as appropriate. We anticipate training to commence within the next 30 to 45 days. That's March 16, 2009. There are no documents after that that close the loop on what happened. That's correct. I, I found no further documents related to that. I, you know, obviously, the training did not occur, and the budget continued to reflect that their water rescue was a performance measure in the department budget. In fact, in the current budget, it's still in there. And because the former fire chief and the former city manager are current in lit currently in litigation with the city, it was not appropriate to ask them for interviews in this report. I did not interview them. That's correct. I was aware of the litigation. I did not approach them. Okay.